recently been experimenting with, with oh, just using the computer to do video at all. And oh, I see. It's not, I'm not entirely happy. I see. It's a, I mean, this room is actually pretty good. Yeah. Uh, the, like, I can pretty easily get the blackboard to fill the, uh -huh. the screen, but very often the recording isn't high enough that you can actually read the chalk oh, I see. So, I've started recording some of my lectures. Yeah, uh, yeah. And, you know, if there are students going to be away or something. Sure. It works. Well. I do it just on my iPhone. Oh, really? And um, it records at 720p. Wow. Okay. Like high yeah. 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 Well. Unfortunately, my iPhone has a badly scratched lens, and I can barely even oh, take photos shit. anymore on it. But, uh, That's unfortunate. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm sort of surprised that it's high enough quality. It's all right. <laughs> oh, yes. I'm not using this. Yes. So. Yes. There is a tight amount of space for three cubes. It's called the outer space. It's developed by color appointment. It's not a manifold. Tight amount of space is manifold. Outer space is not a manifold. But otherwise, it's
also two kinds of superconductors. These are taken as trivial coefficients or these are interesting coefficients. Well, the real Tell them that it's right. Um, no, um, no, the, no, oh, really? Yeah. Oh, gotcha. Well, yeah. uh, so, this is the first non department topology seminar in the quarter. Our speaker is Scott Morrison of uh, Berkeley and Australian National University. Soon enough. Yeah. Soon enough, yes. Uh, and a number of other places, but why, why list them all? Uh, but anyway, he'll be speaking about uh, a lot of homology or foreign. Good, thanks. Great. Thanks very much for the invitation. Um, so, uh, the point of the talk today is to define for you uh, an invariant of four manifolds based on Kravano homology. Um, this is joint work with Kevin Walker, who's hiding off the back of the room there. Um, if, you have any difficult, if you have any difficult <laughs> questions, I'll, uh, I, can, I can refer you to him. Um, but as well as just giving you the definition, um, I really want to uh, struggle to open this chalk. <laughs> oh, there we go. I really want to. Um, explain to you the, the entire recipe and the, 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 the things that we were thinking uh, while coming up with this definition of an, of an invariant of four manifolds from Kravana homology. So in fact, the Kravana homology will, will only appear in the second half of the talk, and it's all going to be general recipes at the beginning. Uh, just to um, dampen anyone's uh, enthusiasm, in case they're getting enthusiastic, we know very, very little about this invariant we define. Um, and computations seem rather difficult, and I can't tell you very much about what information is captured or otherwise by this invariant. But if there's time, I'll say a little bit about that. Okay, so today, uh, a vector space, just gonna write KH of W4 could be an invariant of a smooth format. In fact, I'm going to construct something a little bit more general. Uh, w may have boundary. Uh, and indeed, a link. L sitting in that three manifold boundary. And we get invariant of this pair. The K of L sitting inside the boundary of a four manifold. So for any pair like that. I'm going to produce some vector space for you. And uh, this generalizes Kravana homology in a very simple sense that KH of a link in the boundary of the standard four wall is the same as what people usually talk about as the Kravana homology of a link. Okay, but we're just allowing you to put a link in any three manifold, but you have to specify the four manifold that that, that three manifold is the boundary. Okay, so that's the last Kravana homology for another twenty minutes. Um, so you have uh, yeah. you the definition only for uh, original Kravana homology, not for generalization, uh, not for SLM generalization. Um, uh, no, definitely not. So. So to, to, well, I mean, I, I, I fully expect that one day one will be able to do this for all of the generalizations. Um, but in order to do this construction, there's going to be one extra thing about Kravana homology that we need to know to make this all work. And at the moment, we only know that for the original SL2 Kravana homology, and in fact, we only know it in characteristic 2. So that these vector spaces I produce will just be in, in characteristic 2. On and off, we think we can do it. Uh, over the integers, but not today. Um, so, what I'll tell you today is certainly only the original one, 
but I don't see any long-term disruption to doing it. Okay, so here's a recipe. Variant of n manifolds starting from what I'm, what I'm going to call a disk lag n category. So maybe you got more than you bargained for coming to this talk. I'm also going to tell you yet another definition of n category. Uh, no matter how many you, you already knew, maybe it's too many, even if you only knew zero before. Um, but I want to quickly sketch for you our notion of, a, of an n category that we call a disk like n category, and then show you the recipe that, that produces invariance of manifolds from these. This is just the, the usual TQFT story somehow, but I want to tell it to you in a particular, a particular way. So obviously what we're going to do once I've shown you this recipe is I'm going to show you how to use Kavanaugh homology, the original gadget, to construct a disk-like four category, and then I'm just going to plug that disk-like four category into this recipe I'm, I'm showing you now uh, to, produce, to produce the invariant. Okay. So what on earth is a disk-like category? So a disk-like, well, let me just show you the definition for n equals two, because it's, uh, it's nice to have concrete examples, but you, you can quickly work out the general definition. So first of all, the main piece of data is for k0, 1, or 2, so up to whatever level our category is, we need a functor. From k balls to set, okay? So what do I mean by cables here? This is a little this is a little category consisting of all things which happen to be diffeomorphic to a cable and the diffeomorphisms between them. Okay? So this is a little groupoid of all the cables. So what this function is. So you, a subcategory of the category of topological spaces. Yes, yes. I'm, I'm taking just the, the spaces the which are yeah, this is a groupoid in particular. Just all the all the things here are equivalent to each other. They're just the things that happen to be cables the, and the homeomorphisms between them. Or the homeomorphism is the isomorphism class of k dimensional. So this is the continuous category or the smoother category? We're going to have to work smooth for all of this. Uh, I mean, okay, so I think we, if I'm just telling you what a disk like category is, you can choose what sort of structure you want to put on the cables. For our application, we'll be, okay. we'll be using smooth. Okay, so a subcategory of the category of the smooth manifold with the boundary. Yep. Just just the isomorphism class of the smooth ball. Exactly. No. Okay. So, so the. Oh yeah, and, and and maybe another thing to say to, to what you just said there, the morphisms here are just the different morphisms, and only the equivalence is not not other maps between balls. Okay. So what might this look like? So we might let's call our. So do you do you allow uh, reactivity just? Uh, so again, that's up to you. Uh, you you can you can that's the sort of variation in the structure of balls that you can that you can decide for yourself, and you'll get slightly different notions of just like n categories as, as you make those choices. Um, uh, I guess for our application, um, we're uh, not going to not flipping over the ball. Not going to flip over the ball. Yeah. Uh, but. I reserve the right to change my mind on that shortly. <laughs> um, okay, so let's look at an example of what such a thing might look like. Well, so I'm going to call my, my two category F, and I'm telling you the zeroth part of it, what the functor is on zero balls, and maybe I could just declare that it takes any zero ball just to the singleton set containing that, that ball. Okay, that's not very interesting. What might I tell you up at the next level? Well, the set that I could associate to some one ball, I could tell you that I want to take the finite subsets of that ball. Now, 
know, what might I tell you for some tubal? Maybe, maybe before I, I tell you this particular example, just let me um, explain to you what you should be thinking about these sets. Here, I'm telling you um, what the set of all one morphisms should look like, which happen to have this shape, okay? So in, in our categories here, we're going to have lots of different types of one morphisms and lots of different types of two morphisms, and the types will be indexed by the underlying manifold of sigma. So I'm, telling you, I'm going to tell you there a set of two morphisms of this particular shape. This funny thing that you might imagine a rectangle or a bible or something like that. So the zero morphisms of the object. Oh, okay. I, I'm starting to see what you're doing. Okay. Okay. So unfortunately, um, I'm going to say something a little bit complicated here. Um, but let me go for it. So I'm going to be taking some linear combinations here. But I'll, I'll come back to that in a moment. This is just the idea that I, I want to give you an example of like a. Uh, a category enriched in vector spaces, where at the top level we have vector spaces worth of, of morphisms, not just sets. But I'll, I'll explain that in a bit more detail. So the, the set I'm going to put here, maybe let me color for this. Okay. Will be the set of all um, all embedded one manifolds in that ball, meeting the boundary transversely. Maybe modulus and relations that we'll talk about later. And what on earth does this C mean here exactly? Well, I don't really want to take linear, arbitrary linear combinations of any embedded one manifolds you can draw in here. What I want you to think is that we're only taking linear combinations of, Im of embedded one manifolds that meet the boundary in the same way. Okay, so I can take this diagram plus another diagram that meets the boundary in exactly the same way, but I don't want to ever think about linear combinations that meet the boundaries in different ways. So really I'm defining here a big, a big disjoint union of vector spaces, one for each boundary pattern. Okay? Because you're making the temporally mean category. I'm, I'm on the way to making the temporally mean category. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why I'm doing this particular example. When you're talking about um, two disks, by meeting yeah. the boundary in the same way, you're just narrowing the same number of points? In that same finite fellowship. Yeah. Properly embedded, also. Yeah, I, I mean, there, there are a few awkward issues here. If you really want to work in this smooth case, you maybe should sort of have collars here and some funny, funny stuff. But, but I, I just want to kind of sweep that under the carpet. So if you, if you feel like adding collar in places and that makes you believe what I'm saying is more rigorous, then you can say collar in various places. But I'll admit that. Okay. So that's the sort of data that you might provide uh, for this. But there's more. We need to have boundary restrictions. So suppose uh, I see x, which is a, a k minus 1 ball, sitting inside the boundary of b, a k ball. So I just want you to think there's my 2 ball and I've got some interval sitting in the boundary, okay? Then, uh, we have a map from whatever set we, that we associate to, um, uh, to B down to the set that we associate to X, okay? So this is just saying that if you've shown me some particular, say, two morphism here, you're allowed to restrict it to a piece of the boundary. And sure enough, if we look at the interval in the boundary here, we just see some finite number of points. So that's our restriction map in this case. Okay? So you should think of this as sort of telling you, well, if I've shown you some morphism drawn on a, on a rectangle, say, if you restrict to the top or restrict to the bottom, that might be telling you what the source or target of your morphism is. Okay? But there aren't sources and targets built into this definition because we, we, we have morphisms of arbitrary shapes, not just, not just rectangles. Okay, so maybe... Uh, the example here is just that. So in this example we've been talking about here, that guy um, gets sent to that finite set. Okay. And if you go and read the honest definition uh, that you can find in my paper with Kevin called the blob complex, you'll see that we have to get a little, little bit technical, and sometimes you can't restrict to all intervals. There are some conditions. And if this point were on the boundary of the interval, maybe we won't would want to complain. And so, but to say, but morally, this is, this is, we want, we want these maps in all cases. 
Okay, what's the final thing we need? This told us roughly what sources and targets of morphisms were, but we actually need some operations in our pedigree, and we call this glue. So whenever we have a ball, written as a union of two smaller balls along some codimension one ball, so you're just going to think here, here's B1, here's B2, we glue them together along that interval there, and the whole picture is, is big B, we need a map from whatever set we associated to B1. I'm going to take a fiber product here in a moment, I'll come back to. Product with the set we associate to B2 into the set we associate to the big ball. And what's the fiber product here? Well, I just want to take the pairs, a morphism here and a morphism here, we can both restrict it to x in the same way. Okay? So I'm going to write over the, this product over f of x. So I'm just going to take a morphism sitting on this ball, a morphism sitting on this ball, such that they both restrict to the same one morphism along that, that, that gluing interface. And any time we have that configuration, we should get to produce a morphism upstairs, and so the example is just, There are two submanifolds about two different balls, and it's obvious in this example what the definition of the gluing map could be. You just want to send that pair. Okay. Um, Do I require associativity of gluing? Yes. So, so far I've just been telling you sort of all the data we need to talk about a category, and there's going to be a bunch of, of axioms, and, and first and foremost amongst them is that this gluing map is going to be strictly associated. As you glue many balls together into a bigger ball, the, 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 the gluing map is associative on the mass. OK. Now, let's go back to this example. I said maybe we want to impose some linear relations back here. Let me give you some examples of, of things that we might want to impose at that level. Um, so, Some examples of that examples. So one of them we might just want to say, well, this, this is just at the at the top level at, at, at F2 when we're posing some relations. We might want to say, well, isotopy real boundary. Two of these submanifolds which were isotopic fixing the boundary, maybe we just want to consider them the same element. And maybe since once we fixed the boundary we're working in a vector space, we might want to say that every time you see a closed circle, you can delete that at the cost of putting in some, some scalar multiple. And, well, something that you can observe once you've applied these two relations is that uh, all the vector spaces, like once you fix a boundary condition, all those vector spaces are finite dimensional. They're just the, the number of crossingless matchings of the number of points you see around there. And in fact, this gadget here, this is the temporary leave category. You've seen that already. Um, but just, just described in these particular axioms that we want to use today. OK, so what are some other examples? Well, we're just going to stick with the, the temporary leave example. We might say, let's use those relations, but impose a little bit more. For example, we could, we could just say, well, let's just allow ourselves to reconnect strings like that, and maybe um, let's have that loop value equal to 1. Okay? It's actually pretty easy to see that if you do all of this, then all of those vector spaces become one-dimensional, at least if the number of boundary points was even. It's odd there's just no one-manifolds that fit inside, and otherwise it just doesn't matter how you connect things up. But then there are other strange examples. So as, a, as above at the top, but you could say instead delta equals square root 2 and impose this ridiculous looking thing. It doesn't really matter what the details are for a moment, but here's some crazy linear combination of things involving three strings. We could set that equal to 0. And it turns out that if you do that, then all of these vector spaces are finite dimensional, but they, they grow more slowly than they do here. But um, well, they, they, they grow in some way. And there's a whole very complicated and interesting story just about what you could have put in here. 
Um, I mean, if I'd just written down some arbitrary linear combination, I actually would have collapsed everything, and all my vector spaces would have become zero dimensional. And if you know anything about, well, temporary leave at roots of unity or, or quantum groups and so on, you, 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 you might know uh, what you can, how to think about what you can put in here. But I think if you do know that stuff, I just want to advertise all this as kind of a, an elementary way to, to enter that subject. Okay, forget that. Okay, let's go on. Negative square root. Negative square root? Yeah? No, Oh, oh, okay. Ah, oh, yes, 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 yes. I, I copied and pasted this from a place that uses bad conventions. Uh, thank you. Yes, I agree. Okay, yeah, because the pluses it would have collapsed to zero. Um, okay, so this is what I want you to think of when I say a disk like category. I haven't tried to write down all the axioms for one, and I'm not going to try and write down all the axioms for one. Um, but um, how do people feel about this so far? Are they deeply unhappy? Do they want another example? Uh, any, any questions about this way of thinking? Is that two categories just because you stopped with the two things? Exactly, yeah, yeah. So, so for an, all, I get, all I have to do to say an n category here is add functors, these functors from 0 up to n, and then um, um, well, for some reason why you stopped with well, I, I stopped with two, so I could draw pictures. <laughs> so I couldn't say, but he's a good example. There are more examples for two than for higher. Yes, yeah, so certainly there are the plentiful sources of examples in, in n equals two. Uh, for n equals three, you need to think about braided tensor categories and things like that to get examples. And for n equals four, well, I'm going to show you today the only example I know of that's somehow specific to n equals four that really satisfies all these axioms. Seems that. Uh, you're doing that creation uh, can be used to extend this from both to more general setting. Absolutely, now that, that's what I'm doing next. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I will, I will, I will say exactly that. Uh, now, uh, one thing to say about which end we're looking at, something that I didn't say in amongst the many axioms, is that. So remember here, so these are, these are functors here. So if I give you a diffeomorphism of a, from one cable to another, uh, a particular example has to, give, has, to, has to come with an isomorphism between the sets. Now at the top level, we ask, we, we insist that if we act by some diffeomorphism which is isotopic to the identity, then that map it gives you on sets is, is actually the identity. So diffeomorphic, uh, isotopic diffeomorphisms at the top level have to give you the same map. And that's, a, that's, a, that's the real big way in which the particular n comes in. That's a condition that only applies at the top level. It doesn't apply at any other level. So, so I think that should have been explained. Well, okay, so one more thing to say about this is that this isn't trying to capture the most general notions of n categories that people might want to work with, but only of n categories with duals. Um, or, I mean, in the two category case, case, people say pivotal category. And the way you can see that is just that, well, there's, a, there's a, a symmetry of balls turning them upside down. I can rotate balls around. Again, those are meant to give me corresponding maps on the sets. And that corresponds to all the algebraic notions of what you have. OK, let's generalize from balls to end. So given a, a, a disk like n category, here's an invariant of n vectors. And generally, I mean, if, if our top level morphisms were vector spaces, then this is going to be a vector space valued invariant of n -manifold. You enrich somewhere else, you get something else up here. Okay. Here's the definition. So I'm going to write this as so f was my n category. I'm going to write f as an arrow underneath it of w, just an arbitrary n. Okay. Here goes. So consider first 
the pose of all the compositions of W. D of W, say, of W. So what does this mean? Well, it's just all the ways to realize W as a nice union of balls, where nice means that uh, I can glue the balls together in some order, so that it all, uh, so I'm always gluing along some submanifold, and at every point I have a nice manifold on the, on the thing that I'm building. Okay? Uh, I mean, it's more general than a, than a handle decomposition of W, but you should think something kind of like that. Okay, so what is this post set? Well, let me just draw a picture. It's just the poset given by uh, gluing some of the balls together into larger balls. Okay, I can get from here to here just by gluing those two balls into a bigger ball here, and so on. Okay, it's just the, this is just the refinements of ball decomposition. Yes? Are the manifolds to the thing that's compact? Um, or it doesn't matter? Uh, yeah, sorry. I, I, um, yes, you should be thinking of compact manifolds. Sorry. Yes. Can you, I'm sorry. Can yes. you explain that? Okay. So, so each of the, the elements of this poset is just a way of writing W as a nice union of balls. Okay. Okay. And so I have an arrow between two, two ways of doing it. If this decomposition is obtained from this one, just by taking two balls, which are adjacent and, and sort of touch each other nicely, and gluing them together to obtain to turn them into a single ball here. It's, a, it's as simple as that. Yeah, it's just the refinement of, of decomposition of the balls. Okay. So we've got that thing that we associate to our manifold. And um, the next observation is just that, well, if we have one of these just like n categories, we get a functor from that poset into vector spaces. So for each ball decomposition, it's meant to give us a vector space. And for each refinement of a ball decomposition, well, each anti-refinement, I guess, of a ball decomposition, it's meant to give us a map between those vector spaces. So what does it do? So F applied to some ball decomposition is the following enormous ghastly thing. First of all, it's a giant direct sum over boundary conditions. Uh, let me keep writing and come back and say what that is. Oh, the tensor product over the balls we see so, of oh, the functor applied to that ball. Okay. So what do we mean by, by boundary conditions here? So I mean that you should take the sort of the codimension one stuff you see here, all the interfaces between the balls, and think of those as, as also as being a big union of balls. Okay? And on each of those pieces, I just want you to take some n minus one morphism and draw it there. Okay? So that, that's what a boundary condition means. It means a labeling of all the codimension one stuff by codimension one morphisms, by n minus one morphisms. And what do, what do I mean here? Well, I just mean when I look at this ball, I look at the boundary conditions I assign to it, and only take the subspace here of those n morphisms which have those boundary conditions. Another way of saying it would just be I take this huge tensor product of all of the sets associated to all the different balls, but then I only take some slice of this where um, whenever two balls meet, I only take an element in here, tensor an element in here, if they both restrict to the same thing on the, on the face that they share. Okay? So it's just some, some big subspace of the, of the tensor product of the sets associated to all the different balls. Okay, but this is a huge, gigantic thing, and this is, this is some infinite dimensional nasty thing we're assessing. Okay, and what do we do to an arrow? Well, if we have some um, coarsening of a ball decomposition, we send this to, well, we'll just write the gluing map. 
So in, in some coarsening here, well, you can think of this as we've chosen two of the balls and glued them together. So what we can do is we can just apply the appropriate gluing map up, map up here. We leave all of the tensor factors alone that correspond to balls that we're not gluing together. And for the two sets corresponding to the sets we're gluing together, we just apply the gluing map. And we're always allowed to apply the gluing map because we only took the subspace here where, where things restricted properly to the, the, to the shared bounds. Okay. Can you also say that yep. you get extended topological quantum field theory from this business? Yeah, so, so whenever you follow this recipe, you get something that extends all the way down. I'm, I'm only telling you the, the top dimensional piece at the moment. I mean, it, it gives you um, something that's extended all the way down, but maybe is decapitated. That is, I've got an n category, and I get vector spaces for n manifolds, but there's no guarantee in this recipe that I get anything at all for an n plus 1 manifold. It only gives me the, the vector space invariance. This recipe doesn't talk at all about the numerical invariance uh, one level higher up. So, I mean, the, the, to get that, you need some, some quite strong condition on the end category that you're putting in. This recipe, as I'm saying, it just uniformly gives you the, the end dimensional piece, not the end plus one dimensional piece. OK, so let me, I've said what that functor is. Let me tell you the, the, the definition now. This under arrow guy, so yeah, under arrow of W, is now just well, the limit along this poset of ball decompositions of F. Okay, let's say this much more concretely. What 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 is that definition? Well, it's saying you should take your W and uh, an, an element of this vector space we're defining. What is it? It's just chop your your ball W up. You have to chop your manifold W up into balls. For each of those balls, pick an n morphism of that shape, such that all of their boundaries agree along the ways the balls connect. Okay? But, so that's a typical element of this thing we're defining, but I have to identify them. I, uh, what, I, what I do is I identify one of those elements with another one if one can be obtained from the other just by coarsening the decomposition and, and gluing the maps together. So I might have had some element on this ball decomposition, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. I picked all my morphisms on those balls. Well, that element of the invariant we're defining is declared to be the same, that's what the limit means, as what you get by gluing A and B together on that one, tensor all the other things over here, okay? So an element looks like, choose a way of decomposing it, choose a morphism on each piece, but we identify things that are related by, by changing the, the coarseness of our decomposition. Okay, Whew. let's uh, let's see what what this looks like uh, on some examples on, on some particular manifolds with those examples that we had over there. Let's see what we can uh, what we can do. Yeah, I, I think that was the the, the the worst of the abstract nonsense in, in this talk. That's more concrete from here on out. Okay, so um, let's um, let's do this one instead. So if we take so this this idea on the left two panels, this yep. is just exactly the scheme model construction generalized to n dimensions. Yep, yep. Okay. It's 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 not meant to be anything. More. Um, yeah, uh, so, um, yeah, um, I, it, it's true that I, I could have given this talk in a, in a different way and just sort of directly talked about building a scheme module from the ingredients in Kavana from Molecule without this bit of an excursion. But That's all right. I, I, I like this, this way of thinking about okay. scheme modules, so I, I wanted to advertise it. Okay, the formalization uh, of the scheme module construction. That's perfectly reasonable. Uh, yeah. Uh, um. Oh, did I mean limit or curl limit? Oh. I meant curl limit. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, sorry. It's a. Yeah. What I was describing to you all along was the curl limit. I think this way of thinking. Okay. And I, it finally occurred to me that I'd written the wrong thing because the other point of 
all of this formalism is that if you want to understand what the blob complex is, which is what Kevin and I wrote this enormous paper about, then in some sense you just need to replace this word co-limit here with homotopy co-limit and you understand everything. Um, but, well, yeah. uh, okay, so let's let's look at this in a, in a little example before we finally get on to go on. So let's just compute this for a torus. Well, it's just Linear combinations with one manifold to one on the torus. Well, uh, modulo whatever these relations were. I mean, hopefully, you can see that this answer is what comes out of all of that nonsense. I mean, it says chop up your torus into, into disks. On each disk, draw some one manifolds that glue together nicely. And then uh, uh, and then the, the, the quotient we take by identifying things, identifying coarser and finer refinements, just says, well, forget about how you chopped it up into balls and just draw the down one manifolds. Okay. So what does that tell you? Well, this thing is just a, some vector space uh, with basis the, um, the homology of that surface um, with, uh, with Z12 coefficients. Okay. So that something nice and small in this example. And then uh, maybe if you'd done the other example, you would have got something, something else. Uh, this is maybe a little bit hard to describe explicitly, but you would have got something nine-dimensional in that case. Just by thinking about the one manifold you can draw on a torus, modulo, modulo these words. I sort of like, um, I, mean, I, I learned to like this example from, from hearing Kevin give versions of it at time. And uh, I think something I've, I've heard him say is that if only the history of maths had been a little bit differently, um, and people had first of all thought about homology somehow by this way, they, they might have ended up thinking about the homology of surfaces with coefficients in a fusion category much earlier than they did. Um, they thought about what pictures mod relations you can draw on surfaces a bit earlier. Okay, so this formalism, as, as Greg points out, um, captures scan theory, and in particular, um, you can see all of Turaev bureau and Reshitik and Turaev and Kranietta theory all, all sort of inside of this picture, at least the, well, the nearly all of it. Um, and um, yeah, okay. So let's uh, let's try and do some Kavanaugh for more. Oh boy, I've uh, not been paying attention for time. Let's see how this goes. So let me define a four category for you. I'm presumably meant to be finishing the four. Roughly speaking, yes. Yes, yes, yes. You, I don't know if the room is used after. The room was used after. <laughs> You said four. Oh, by you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I know. I'm sorry. I, lost I thought it was thinking five, but yeah. Okay. Okay. So what is the Kavanaugh? Kavanaugh four is a pretty stiff limit, actually. Yeah. What is the Kavanaugh four category? Let me get going and tell you something. Okay. I just need to tell you all these sets that I want to associate to various things. Uh, for, for zero and one balls, it's very boring. It just gives you back the singleton of that thing that you fed in. For a two disk, it starts getting a little interesting. It just associates the finite sets in the interior. For k3, it's a three ball. So maybe I'll tell you which boundary I'm, I'm, I'm showing you. It just gives you the set of all embedded tangles with that boundary. as an example. And I don't mean these up to isotope. I actually mean the gigantic set of you know, embedded tangles. Now, what do I need to tell you for KH4? Well, <laughs> for each four ball with specified boundary conditions, I meant to tell you some vector space. What are these boundary conditions meant to look like? Well, there's something that when you restrict it to a disk, just looks like a tangle, okay? 
And obviously that is just a link in the in the boundary field. So for each link in the uh, in the boundary of my four ball, I meant to tell you some vector space. And what do I tell you? I tell you the Kavanaugh homology of that link, which is some vector space. Okay. So the challenge now is to show that all of this data has gluing maps and actually fits together to form a four category as I, as I define it. So how do we do that? Let's um, construct gluing maps. So what do I need to do? Well, when I glue two balls together, what does the picture look like? Here's one four ball. And here's another four ball. Each with a link in its boundary that I'm proposing to glue together. So you're meant to think that these are two faces that look the same. I'm about to glue them together. And they have the same link. Uh, they have the same tangle in those pieces that we're about to glue together. Okay? So here's, a, here's some T1, T2, there's the very image of T2, and there's T3. And I'm going to give you a map from all of that to the vector space that we're associating to um, the glue together guy. Okay, so I need to construct a map from KH of T1, connect some T2, tensor KH of T2 bar, Connect some T3 to KH of T1 connect some T3. Now, Kavanaugh homology gives us this. Uh, Kavanaugh homology is functorial. So, cobordisms between links give, uh, give linear maps. So, obviously, I want to try and construct this gluing map that I need from some cobordism, and it's pretty easy to see what that is. Um, so, well, let me maybe, what's the simplest example I can do at the same time? So changing slightly from the tangles I was using there, let's, um, say I have to uh, glue these two together. Well, there's an obvious cobordism that sort of cancels these mirror image tangles against each other. Okay? What do I do first? I'll sort of do it in place to save some time. I can just choose the two closest points and stick them together. Okay, that was some cobordism. So I got some linear map from the initial disjoint union to this guy. And then I use another cobordism that gives me another linear map from here to here. And then I take the cobordism, which is just an isotopy that sort of undoes these two crossings with the right of two move. And finally, I take the cobordism, which just caps off that component in the middle there. Okay? And so you saw there some cobordism from here to there. So Kavanaugh homology provides the map. And uh, so that's going to be our gluing map. And now the fact that when we say Kavanaugh homology is functorial, isotopic maps, uh, isotopic cobordisms, give equal maps of the nature of Kavanaugh homology, and this is what gives us associativity of gluing on the nose. If we uh, glue two tangles together and then glue another tangle together, and we look at the cobordisms we use to define that gluing map, it's just a matter of changing the heights of critical points, in fact, to see that the surfaces we use to define those gluing maps are actually isotopic. So the gluing, the gluing operation really was associative. Well, so in your... Yep. Oh, sorry, I should... Yeah. A, bit, Go a ahead. little bit more aggressive, <laughs> but in your rapidly draining time, now, yep. one, why are you restricted to characteristic two? And two, yep. it kind of feels like some information is being ditched because you're doing this in the category of graded vector spaces rather than in the category of chain complexes. Um, Yes. I don't know if that's. I, and, don't, know if, yes. I don't know if the answer to the second question is really yes. And 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 both of those are due to technical difficulties, which I will now reveal to you in the remaining two seconds I have. <laughs> it's slightly more than two seconds I know. But um, 
Yeah, uh, um, yes, those, those, those are both defects of what we can do at the moment that would be lovely to be able to remedy and we, and we don't you know how to do. Sh you uh, should be able to remedy both of those. Uh, uh, Z2, yes, I think so. Um, working in vector spaces is what I want to remain agnostic to. You would need an awful lot more structure in Kubana homology than we know about now in order to make all this construction work there. Um, I think um, we can talk about it. There's a lot of, I think there's a lot to be done to, to do this with the complexes rather than the complex groups. Okay, I think that's actually right. Okay, what do they hide? Um, and what I hid is what forces us to work more to for now. What do they do here? I wrote on the right hand side here the Kuvano homology of some link in S3, or in, even worse, maybe in the boundary of a, of a, of a four ball. Okay? That's not what Kuvano homology gives us. So we need K of a link in S3. Okay? Ignore the fact that this might not be the standard S3. That difficulty is easy. It's just S3. But Kavano homology, from its combinatorial definition, only gives an invariant of links in B. Now, this, you might, thinking about sort of old-fashioned non-invariance, you think this is a silly distinction. I mean, if I have a link in S3, I can delete a point, and I get a link in, in B3, and the links were isotopic in B3 exactly if they're isotopic in S3. Who cares? But Kavana homology uh, is, is a categorical link in invariance. What does that mean? Well, Yeah, it, it, it gives you, for each embedded link, a particular vector space. For each isotopy between links, it gives you some isomorphism between those. It doesn't just guarantee that they're isomorphic. And the, the, the invariance condition in Kavano homology is that uh, if you have two isotopies between links, which are themselves isotopic, then the maps between the vector spaces you, should get, you get should be and now that we're in S3, a, well, when, once we're talking about that, there's a difference between S3 and B3. Okay, so uh, in S3, uh, cobordisms, so more generally, and Kavano homology gives you a map for a cobordism, and when, the co when two cobordisms are isotopic, those maps are equal. Cobordisms can be isotopic, but cease being after the leader point. So here's the picture to have in mind. T here is just some tangle with two boundary points, and I start with it closed up. And then I um, start passing this, this strand around T. as I'm running out of time. I hope everyone can, can see what I'm talking about. I'm drawing a picture here where I leave T fixed and I just pick up this string and I sweep it 360 degrees around. around T. That's all I'm intending to do with it. But I wanted to draw it out like this so you could see sort of a long sequence of Rademeister moves. A Rademeister 1 move here, then a long sequence of Rademeister 2 and 3 moves as we pass this string behind the fixed angle, and so on. So this thing here is isotopic to the identity in S3. You can sort of think about the, the path traced out by that strand as we sweep it around and just inflating it out through infinity, coming back to the identity. But once you're in B3, it's just not, not isotopic. So if we want to talk about Kavano homology in S3, we need to know, is this the identity map on, uh, on the original tangle? Okay? And given the usual definition of Kavano homology, this is very hard to see. We have some enormous composition of random moves. And our only access to what this map is is to think about composing that long sequence of random masters. 
Okay? Now, this is where mod 2 comes in. We can show this in, in mod 2 that, that, uh, that this map is the identity. And on and off over the last couple of years, we've had a bunch of, well, at the moment, all failed proofs that do this over the integers, but we don't, we don't know. But you conjecture that, you, that that's an equality. Um, okay, so you need to use the right version of Kovana primology. That is, you need to use um, the one that, that Kevin and David Clark and I fixed from the original one that actually, so Kovana primology is actually functorial rather than functorial after a sign, otherwise you're dead in the water. But yes, I conjecture that that one really gives you the identity anyway, and, and, you, and you can just work over the images, but we don't know how to prove that. Mod 2, life gets a, bu a bunch easier. And, uh, and then we can show that that map is really equal, which means that Kovana homology really is the right sort of gadget here. It's actually a categorical invariant of links in S3, and so we're really allowed to wrap it on the right hand side here. Okay? And then you've heard the rest of the story. Once you've got this thing, you check the gluing maps can be defined as they need to be, and then you can run the usual scan, scan module construction that produces an invariant from Kovana. Um, if I had time, I don't, I could tell you a little bit about what we know about how to compute this thing. I mean, all of these scan module things have gluing formulas when you that let you compute the invariant of a manifold by thinking of it as glued together from two pieces. We can write down those formulas for this invariant. We can't actually use them to, to, to do any calculations except on extremely simple things. And even those, we're pretty shaky on what the answers look like. OK, I'll finish there. Thanks. All right, so two remarks, two things. Uh, one is that uh, we can uh, explore possibilities for dinner for those people interested in dinner uh, right sure. after <laughs> this talk, although there will be another talk starting. And the other is that we still have just a few minutes in case there are any more questions. Uh, the next talk in the same room is at 4 10, and it's 4 02. What are the obstacles for uh, providing the refract scheme? Um, I mean, essentially, all, all here. Um, we just don't have the faintest idea how to how to prove something like this in, in general. I mean, the, the the way that we prove this. Okay, so let me explain the problem. The um, the thing that we need to do in in, in checking this is the identity is understand. We'll think really carefully about how the right amounts for tree group works. And the nice thing, at least when you're working with two, is you can think about resolving this crossing. And so, so we're trying, what are we trying to do? We're trying to get a map between these two tangles. And well, what is this thing in Kravano homology? It's some chain complex that sort of goes from this tangle to this tangle, and where each of these is now representing complexes, and we've got some chain map between them. And we're trying to get down to this guy. Okay. The thing that works nicely, mod two, is that you can describe the randomized to three map between them as sort of having three components. A piece there that's just the identity. An off-diagonal piece, which after a bit of work you show doesn't matter and doesn't come into the calculations. And a map here, which at least when you're working in the mod two world, is just uh, a composition of an R2 and an R2 inverse. The, the, the chain map here is the same thing as Kavano homology would have defined for undoing that R2 and then redoing one downstairs. Okay. If you work in either our disorientation setting that gets all the signs right outside mod 2, or you work with Kavano Rubzansky, the right hand side here is some complicated thing. It's, some, it's not actually a tangle, it's some embedded, it's some embedded graph. And um, we don't know what to say about what, I mean, we don't, we don't, we don't have anything good to say about what the right amount of tree map looks like over here, so we can't do the calculations. So, so say, uh, shortly, if you, if you have uh, Havana Vrishansky in the sphere, yep. then you are done. Uh, exactly. So, uh, so particularly if you have some geometric construction of Havana Vrishansky that doesn't require going through all this combinatorial mess, and you can just leapfrog straight to there, then you can plug it in straight here. Do you get some kind of a, a categor categorification of a numerical uh, for manifold invariants in this way? <laughs> So, yeah, it's a bit of a long answer. Um, um, 
No, you shouldn't really be expecting that, I mean, it's a long story, but you, when, you, when you go through it, you shouldn't expect that the Euler characteristic of this answer, say, has anything to do with the Jones polynomial directly. Um, it's, a, it's a little bit strange. Um, the, yeah, I, I, I could tell you more. Thanks.